Praxis Hollywood, and this is one mighty intense movie. And I'd like to ask, start with you, David. Tell me why this was your follow-up to Animal Kingdom. Um, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent quite a lot of time after Animal Kingdom came out, and it felt like my life had turned upside down, um, trying to work out what to do next. You know, and I, 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 I I felt like I had a lot of stuff to wade through, a lot of, not just projects, but um, possibilities, uh, different ways of working, um, blah, blah, blah. I, anyway, I, I came back to, I, I, I found myself after like a, a lot of, you know, a lot of doing a, a million meetings and, and reading a, a lot of screenplays that I knew I wasn't going to make. Um, coming back to the idea of really, really being attracted to the idea of, of making the rover because I knew I wanted to, I, 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 it would allow me the opportunity to play in a similar sort of tonal world to the world of Animal Kingdom, a, you know, a kind of brooding menace, but um, it also, it offered me the opportunity to, to do something that was very different on a formal level, you know, whereas the Animal Kingdom is a big sort of, a, a sort of, a dense um, urban fabric, uh, you know, and an almost a kind of slightly heightened social realist kind of crime drama. But I just loved how it's simple and elemental, and uh, you know, almost like a kind of dark, violent fable. This movie was, and that it would, and that it was, you know, instead of that dense fabric, it was just it was just a couple of characters um, having a really intensely intimate relationship in a vast, empty, hostile landscape. Well, tell me why, I, I think I read uh, one of the articles out of Can how this story sort of came out of a feeling of frustration, a feeling of anger that you had at the time and you channeled that into the story. I mean, yeah, when I was, as I was drafting it later, you know, and I started redrafting it, this wasn't long after the, the economic crisis. I, I mean, I did just find after, at a certain point in my life, that I was carrying around this weird feeling of despair and or anger, you know, I, I, maybe it's just me and I'm getting older or whatever, but you know, this was, this was not long after the economic crisis. It would seem that we had just willingly surrendered the world to psychopaths in suits, um, while simultaneously, while simultaneously just throwing the towel in on, you know, what is arguably the greatest moral challenge of our time, which is addressing climate change. And I just found myself waking up in the morning, going, eh, "What's the point?" You know, I mean, and like, I mean, I, that's a bit glib. It was an actual kind of despair that, for the first time since I was a little kid, in a way, I actually found myself not thinking about the future as a good place. You know, <laughs> and I started funneling that despair and that anger into the world of the movie. You know, this whatever this kind of near future is, and funneling the anger, especially in the guy's character. Well, Guy Pierce, who you work with on Animal Kingdom. I mean, he was terrific, exceptionally terrific as Eric. And just tell me, like, what it was like to to work with him again. And uh, I understand that you actually wrote the role for him. Yeah, I mean, I love, I really love working with Guy. He's a really, you know, it's, I mean, just as an actor, he's so so beautifully, supremely talented. You know that he he offers. He's a, he's a, he's a pleasure to direct because he offers uh, he he offers a director, you know the the opportunity to perform the tiniest little microsurgical adjustments on a performance. You know, you never, I never have to feel like I'm painting in broad brush strokes with him. Like, we can get right in there. And I never have to feel like I have to pussyfoot around him either. You know, quite often, you, you, you know, when you, 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 you're learning how to direct actors, you know, you, it gets drilled into you that there are certain things you have to play, kind of very simple, sort of playable, Playable actions. It's got to, you know you got to talk in transitive verbs and all this kind of stuff. And with guy, you know, it's like you don't have to do that. You just talk about life. He gets what you're talking about. Then he goes away and very quickly makes it playable for himself. And, but more than anything, in this movie, I really wanted him. Guy does that. He's so good at doing that. Really still, powerful. Uh, that that really kind of powerful and often intimidating stillness that he can also just feel with like very subtle emotional detail. Uh, and this character really needed it. You know, you don't know a lot about this guy, but over the course of the 
film, I, it was important to me that you just slowly get clear hints at the the the, the degrees and types of his, his emotional damage. You know, I read a review, Rob, that said, and I quote, regarding the rover, Robert Pattinson is a revelation. <laughs> you know who wrote that review? Is that me? I did. <laughs> Well, you know, Rob, I want to ask you, how did this project come about for you? Why did you just see, see it as just a really great challenge to do something completely different? Um, I had seen uh, the teaser tra trailer for Animal Kingdom years ago. Um, and I wanted to meet David from that. I just thought it was just what you could pack into one with the air supply song. And uh, just in 60 seconds, you could kind of tell immediately that was someone I want to work with. And I think Animal Game was like one of the best David movies in the last 10 years or something. Um, I also think one of the opening shot of Crossbow is probably one of the best shots in the history of cinema. I haven't got it before. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shot of a bush. I don't think you think it's a good shot. No, <laughs> it's like landing on the crack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this script came along. I met David about a year before I did the script and then read it and thought it was kind of like mind blowing. And um, it was incredibly original and, and uh, it was vicious. I thought it was strangely funny as well. No one else thinks that. <laughs> I, I think it. I, mean, I, I get where you're coming from. Uh, but in terms of like your, the look of your character, the shaved head, or the, the buzz cut rather, and the teeth, I mean, is that something that was sort of laid out for the character, or did you do. Mm -hmm. What else did you bring other than what was written on the page? I don't even know if there was a character description, right? It's just saying from the past. But, but uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything. Um, I don't know, I, I saw these photos of a bunch of guys, kind of <laughs> sort of white trashy looking guys. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the I think that was kind of it was quite a popular echo. Yeah. <laughs> Still <laughs> is. <laughs> and then I thought, yeah, no, I, think it's kind of, I think it's kind of trendy now. So I had to get on it <laughs> well, what about working with Guy? I mean, he's he's uh, really intense in this movie, and I mean, all your your it's the two of you together basically the entire time, and almost, that's almost it, other than the people that you guys shoot. So, uh, what was it like to spending all that time with him, and but you know, sort of pick up from him as an actor? Uh, I mean. He's a lovely person. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of makes it easier. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's it, his part is really, really difficult. I mean, it's basically like a constant force. I mean, he, there's never any, well, very, very rarely a time when this pressure lets up. And I don't quite know how he was doing it. So I don't really know what I've learned. I just learned that it's possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could really feel it, even when we're just sitting in silence in the car. It's he's still sort of radiating. Um, you have a sort of vibration, and you can kind of feel it, and it, it, it kind of provokes tons of reactions. I sure did love dogs. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you, David, the intensity, I, I have not heard or read one review reacting from this movie where the word intense was not mentioned, in a good way, because I mean, that's really just, just to maintain that for the duration of the film. So I understand that you're a fan of John Carpenter, and I uh, was wondering if, if the work of John Carpenter that's inspired you, not just with Animal Kingdom, but with the rover as well. Not really. I mean, I really like John Carpenter, but no, that has never... And I'm sure I absorb everything that I've ever seen by osmosis somehow, but no, I, th I don't... Uh, no. I don't think it ever... There's never been a moment when John Carpenter has entered my thinking on either of these movies. Well, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you, too, listen, uh, obviously, as Angelinos, when it gets hot in L.A. and it's 100 degrees, yeah, people say, oh, it's dry heat, but it's still pretty damn hot. <laughs> and when you walk outside and get your car and it says 108 degrees, you go, damn, that's hot. But where you guys shot this movie, it got well over 110 degrees. I was like 122. 122 is the number. So what was it like filming for, what, two months in those conditions? It was kind of weirdly okay. I actually think it was about 123. 
the week before we went to, we did our, before we started shooting, we did our tech rec, it was like 123, which I think is like 50 degrees Celsius, and it was scary, it was so hot. I mean, we knew we couldn't work in it, it, was, it felt dangerous. But it's amazing what just a drop down, when it drops down to, you know, say 115, 116, it suddenly feels like a cool change. <laughs> and if you've, got, if you've got water to drink and some shade to stand under, it's okay. It's desert heat, you know. Give me that over humidity any day. And also the, the, the flies, I mean, the flies just, I mean, look, look like just were relentless, you know, but, uh, but that really does add to the character. It does add to the vibe. And uh, ultimately, it made for a better film, I think. You know, it's, it's like almost like any kind of movie you make under diversity, out of that uh, diversity and adversity comes a work of art. So, congrats on that. <laughs> um, but I also want to ask you just the, the reactions you've gotten from when the movie premiered in Cannes. And, and it's really just getting a very strong reaction of why do you think people are just really taken so much with the movie and just they just love it so much. And especially, Rob, I mean, the reviews you've got in particular have been just great, so that's got to be a good feeling for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, annoyingly, you always just tend to seek out the bad ones anyway, the good ones. <laughs> and your one obviously will stay in my heart. For <laughs> 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 the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but no, it's great. It's kind of, but you just, you know, you, it, it's more about the experience. I mean, uh, the, the experience and also just when you see something on the page which you love so much right from the beginning, I think most of the time you're just thinking, I just don't want to mess it up. And so right. when you can watch the movie and you feel like you kind of haven't totally messed it up, then <laughs> that's about what I'm trying to aim for. <laughs> and the rest of it's just a bonus. Well, I'd like to open questions up to the audience. If you got uh, questions, please raise your hand. And sir, you in the blue shirt, yeah, nice and loud, please. I was oh. just wondering about the music. It's really like an eclectic mix of songs that you throughout it. I just want to know uh, where the inspiration for those choices. The inspiration for the score and the music. It was very eclectic. Uh, yeah, we. Well, yeah. um, <laughs> it was. I, you know, I, when I'm writing, especially, I start building playlists. Um, just I, I can't write with music playing, but I just, it's just you know over however many months I'm writing, I'm just constantly thinking about the world of the movie that I'm inventing, and we'll just be building playlists, and those playlists get really long, and sometimes they even involve me diving down, like I go down sort of seven hour iTunes rabbit holes, you know, you know, you know, listeners who bought this also like this, and you, know, you follow that for like seven hours, you get to some pretty interesting places, and, and in the course of that, I discovered some people that I really, really loved, you know, like, uh, like Colin Stetson, who does all of that strange saxophone stuff in there, or William Brzezinski, who's this beautiful pianist composer who does these kind of long... Uh, piano loops that sort of fall apart, and then you know compositions by a guy named Giacinto Celsi, just the, which is beautiful string stuff, that principally that just you know feels like metal grating against metal. And what I did find was that you know because it's setting a movie that's a few decades in the future, I didn't want to have to try and make the soundtrack futuristic. I wanted to. I actually really loved the idea of taking very traditional instruments, but ones that were being performed in very unusual ways, and. Uh, um, and yeah, that seemed to do the trick. And then my, and then Anthony Partos, who I worked with on Animal Kingdom, just sort of gave me some of the connecting tissue. Who's got a question? You, young lady. Nice and loud. Interesting, interesting. The question was, did Ray sort of become Eric's lost puppy in a way, right? Yeah, without a dog too. Right, okay, that's a, wow, you really ran into this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfectly reasonable reading. Of, uh, 
Good, good call. Here, here's what I said. I interviewed these uh, gentlemen this afternoon. I said, wait a minute. So I get why it's called the Rover, but is it also be call, called the Rover because Rover is a common dog name? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I thought I was onto something here. <laughs> Who else has a question? Uh, yes, you. Bob. How difficult was it for you, Rob, to have a southern accent? What did you do to prepare? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what accent I'm doing. I didn't really prepare for it that much either. But, and also, I was surrounded by a bunch of Australians, so no one could tell anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was kind of on the, it was, it was on the page. It was, it was a fun, the southern accent was fun. Especially when you add little quirks to it and stuff. Uh, but yeah, when the scoop turned up, I was terrified that he was just going to be thinking, like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? You, young lady. Um, for either or both, both of you, um, what was your favorite scene to shoot and why? What was your favorite scene to shoot and why? Uh, for me, it's. You know, it's kind of, as this is really boring, but for me it's like, you know, that the long campfire scene. I mean, that's from, that for me is the thrill of, the thrill of making movies, just having kind of created two characters and then you get great actors that bring them to life and then you're on, and then you have that, that, that long night where we just m made it work. You know, that, that for me is thrilling. That's the, you just, you know, massaging performances and, and you know, watching a thing that has been in gestation for a long time finally come into being. Who is next? You, sir. Nice and loud. kind of preparation you did for the, some of the long shots that just stayed on the characters for a while? Yeah, I mean, you always allow yourself wiggle room. You always should shoot more than you need. And it was always very important to me that those couple of opening shots be long. A, because I wanted to get a sense of the, um, the, the uh, you know, kind of guy's strange stagnation. You know, the, the, the what's that word? Doesn't matter. Um, um, you know that whatever that this is, you know that that, that at, his atrophy or whatever that this man had, you know, it's, he just he was barely he could barely find reason to move anymore. But I also to pre pre prepare the. I knew I was I'm about to give the audience a big car chase. I want to prepare them at the outset. I want them to know that that's not going to be. This, this isn't going to be a car chase movie. But once that car chase is out of the way, it's going to slow right down. Actually, I I, I have a question about. So if you film this like way out in the boonies of the Australian outback. And okay, so you're filming during the day, it's hot. Okay, night, you lose the light. You shot there for two months. What you guys do at night? <laughs> uh, just looking at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned today that you saw, I mean, that just looking up in the sky was a big deal. Yeah, there's no ozone. It's, it's See the stars. It's, it's not, I mean, you're so far from city lights. I slightly forgot as well. There's, I didn't get to do this, um, but our armorer um, had night vision goggles. Yeah. And apparently, when you're out there and you put night vision goggles on and you look up at the sky, it's like it's awe-inspiring. I mean, it's like literally just the sky is a blanket of stars. Mm -hmm. Worth it right there. Who's, who's next? Yes, you. I have a question for Rob. How long did it take you to learn your lines? Did you do it with the accent you had in mind? Uh, Say that again, I'm sorry? How long does it take you to memorize your lines, and do you do it with the accent already in mind? How long does it take you to memorize your lines? Um, with this, I, uh, I had an accent, most sort of voice is quite. Um, almost immediately of, of really um, but yeah it takes me as I get older for some reason I just can't remember anything <laughs> <laughs> so I need to, to 
I need to do it in an incredibly OCD way. I have like a very specific um, way of running them. 